welcome everybody again to another edition of Crosstalk. We are changing gears and beginning a new season. Uh, this Sunday will be the first Sunday of Advent. Um, Advent is this um, curious time of year in the church where we are getting ready for Christmas, but we are not celebrating Christmas yet. And that's a difficult thing, I think, sometimes for people to get their heads around because so much of our culture is already celebrating Christmas. But the church, in its wisdom, has always understood that it takes time to prepare ourselves to receive the gifts that God wants us, uh, God wants to give us. That's true of Christmas, that's true of um, Easter, and that is true of Pentecost. Yeah, and just one more reflection on the season of Advent. Um, it, it, it really does sort of put us in a different sort of mindset than what our culture is doing in that this is actually the first Sunday of the Christian year. Yeah. <clears throat> so we don't really start our year on January 1st. Um, we start it on the first Sunday of Advent, which I think is great because January 1st is sort of like this big poof and then it's this big letdown. Um, it's a change of a calendar, which is not a big deal, but there is really something to celebrate as we move into this first Sunday of Advent uh, and, and begin the, the Christian year. And you're right, we're getting ready for Christmas, but in kind of a different way uh, than the world gets ready for Christmas. We don't rush into it. I think a lot of people are kind of impatient when they come to Trinity. They want to sing Christmas carols during Advent. And we sing um, relevant hymns and carols, but they're not the Christmas carols yet. That waits till the celebration of Christmas. So things are just a little bit out of sync, which causes some people some question, but it's that way on purpose. Right, absolutely. So um, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, this year um, we have three Sundays that we will be exploring Advent together, and then one Sunday is going to be our cantata. Mm -hmm. um, but for those three Sundays, we're going to be exploring uh, Christmas past, Christmas future, and Christmas present. So that's reminiscent of Dickens's Christmas story. Um, but um, it's important because um, we do have all these different dimensions uh, when we come to Christmas. So as we study Christmas past, um, we find ourselves coming to the prophets, in mm -hmm. particular, coming to the prophet Isaiah. Um, and we find ourselves towards the end of the book. So what is our scripture lesson for this Sunday? Our scripture lesson is going to come out of Isaiah 63 and 64. Those two uh, chapters sort of blend together in the theme. So uh, that's where we're going to be finding ourselves. Sure. <clears throat> and um, what are the themes? Are there any verses in particular that you'd like to share with us from those two chapters? Yeah, I think verse 5 of, of, um, of Isaiah 64 really kind of sums up one of the themes that we're going to be facing and maybe captures the tension. Um, First Sunday of Advent is, is, is a bit awkward. We just got off of a conference call with a lot of pastors. And uh, as we follow the readings of the church, the first Sunday of Advent is kind of hard. It's, it's not always um, joyful. It, it sort of comes as a challenge to us. And I think our culture, once again, we're a little bit countercultural is that as we move toward Christmas, we've got to be happy. This is the jolly holly holiday. And, and if you're not happy, then something's wrong with you. If you're not having the perfect family Christmas or the perfect gift, um, the perfect joy, something is wrong. Um, but we begin with a little bit of a challenge when we come to uh, Isaiah, the end of Isaiah. And it's just a reminder that I think for many people, this season is difficult. It's, it's a broken season. And sometimes I think when we face brokenness, we feel like, well, something's wrong with me. The answer is no, not necessarily. This is why Charlie Brown Christmas is so fantastic. It is. Yeah, Charlie Brown Christmas is actually theologically so profound. But, uh, you know, we come into this place in Isaiah 64 when there's a, a broken nation. Um, and in verse 5, it says uh, about God, uh, you come to help those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But we, when we continue to sin, you are angry. How then can we be saved? And that's kind of the question. Here's a 
a nation that's sinning. And it's not that they're being naughty. It's not that God is being um, picky about behavior. It's, it's what they're doing is really breaking um, life. It's breaking their relationship with God. They're breaking their relationship with each other. And, and they seem just stuck in this place. And so Isaiah asked this question, if, if that's the case, how can we be saved? How, how can there be anything to rejoice in? We live in this really broken world. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to begin this uh, year's Advent um, with the idea of um, longing and desire and also the confession of need mm -hmm. and want. Um, I know you've probably had this experience. Um, what do you buy for somebody who has everything? Now, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's yeah. difficult. Yeah, who knows? A gift card. <laughs> A gift card, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, you know, in order to receive a gift, um, you, you really have to understand that you need something. Yeah. In order to give a good gift, it has to be given to fill a, a particular void or desire. And um, one of the things that we're looking at as we look at Christmas past is what is the desire um, that uh, the, the need, the want, the whole that's being expressed um, that God wants to fill by giving us Jesus? Yeah. And so uh, you pointed out, well, um, Isaiah feels some voids in his experience. So maybe one of the things that would be good to talk about right quick is um, who is Isaiah? And what voids is he experiencing? We're used to language about sin in the church and, and all of that. And, and we're used to ideas about, you know, God coming to be with us personally. But what do you think uh, Isaiah has in mind as he talks about these uh, voids? What did Isaiah do for a living? Yeah. Um, so we know, and we talked about this earlier, Isaiah is the son of Amos. Which, and that should clear it all up. That, right there. <laughs> that says it all. He's just the son of Amos. Well, he finds himself in a family situation. But also, as we um, continue to read those opening verses of Isaiah, we find that he is very well connected into the royal establishment, and he has a job with the kings, and he is working uh, in the royal administration. Yeah. So Isaiah um, lives... Uh, in the, I guess, 750s mm -hmm. um, BC. Um, and he serves as a advisor and administrator in the uh, royal administration in Judah. Uh, Judah. Mm -hmm. um, Israel, the northern kingdom, still exists. And Judah, the southern kingdom, um, is, uh, still exists. And so Isaiah's job, in addition to being a prophet and a person who is uh, intensely interested in, in having a living relationship with a living God. Um, Isaiah is also a person who is uh, deeply tied in to the affairs of state. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's complex. Uh, so Isaiah has to worry about the welfare of the nation of Judah, whatever that means. Um, he has to worry about domestic affairs, the well-being of individual people who are uh, living under the... Um, their rule and reign, citizens. Um, he is also uh, drawn into uh, international politics. And part of Isaiah's job is helping the king, and he spends a lot of time working for Hezekiah, um, helping the king uh, navigate some very delicate international situations. And uh, we know that international relations do have bearing on domestic policy and domestic life. Um, and some of it's very scary. Uh, Isaiah lives through some tense times. It's during Isaiah's uh, career that the king of Israel makes an alliance with the king of Syria, and they declare war on Judah mm. um, and actually uh, make plans to uh, lay siege to, to Jerusalem. So Isaiah lives through some, some very tense situations. Um, and in addition to being a, a very spiritual person, Isaiah is also a, um, I believe, intensely practical person because that's what his job is, is governing. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, in many ways, I mean, he's, he's a patriot in the best sense of the word. He's concerned about his nation. He's concerned about the people, their, yeah. their welfare. 
and he's in a very, very difficult place. And he has a chance to sort of from the top look down and, and see a lot of things happening and be privy to a lot of information and, and a lot of observation. Right. Um, so uh, as we talk, uh, a couple points when we talk about is first, what is the, the gap or what is the void that Isaiah begins to sense? And then C, um, B, A and B, um, how does Isaiah see this gap playing out? And what hope does Isaiah see for this gap? Because that becomes important for understanding the book as well. Mm. Um, Isaiah, uh, you don't have to read too much to see that there are two concerns, I think, that really stand out um, to him in his position as a, a person in government in Judah. The first one has to do with uh, national autonomy. Um, one of the realities of life um, in Judah that hasn't changed very much till today yeah, yeah. is that it is a small country uh, surrounded by a handful of smaller countries, um, but also tied in to the life of the superpowers. Yeah. And um, we mentioned a little bit earlier, it's in uh, the career of Isaiah that Israel and what we would call today Syria make an alliance against Judah. Um, it's also in Isaiah's reign that uh, the superpowers, Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon, are all vying for power. And uh, the tiny nation of, it, of Judah is caught in the middle of all this. And it leads to despair for Isaiah because, um, on the one hand, he can see that autonomy is non-existent. That they can make whatever decisions they want within the realms of Judah, but even those decisions are really influenced to, uh, by and subject to what's right. going on with the superpowers. And, uh, and Isaiah understands that well, and it bothers him. Um, another reality that uh, is connected with this idea of aut autonomy is that not everybody in government understands this, and that there are people who are making decisions under the delusion that they have autonomy. And these decisions are disastrous. Uh, for the nations and the people, and um, everyone will see this in spectacular fashion um, in 720 when the Assyrians come and wipe Israel off the face of the map. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. You, you find these lesser kings after Hezekiah who uh, want autonomy for the, the nation, but it's really their own egos that are just strutting in this, this um, unrealistic sense of of who they are and what the possibilities might be for the nation. And, and because of their own ego drives, they're just putting the nation at risk. Yeah. So that's one major concern is reality of autonomy, political autonomy. I think the other thing that you don't have to read very much of Isaiah to understand is that he is deeply upset about and deeply concerned about uh, social fabric. Um, within the kingdom of Judah, he sees a widening disparity between the wealthy and the poor. And along with that, he sees um, uh, the total disintegration of any sort of justice system um, as the wealthy are, are able to manipulate the legal code to suit themselves. And the poor people are out of luck, out of hope. Um, and this is also deeply disturbing to Isaiah. Um, he, I think anyone who's deeply interested in the well-being of a people, of a society like Isaiah was, um, this is heartbreaking. So these are two concerns that, that Isaiah has that he points out regularly throughout the writings. Um, and those um, concerns stay constant. So that's uh, two of the concerns about Isaiah. One of the other interesting things about the book of Isaiah is that um, the the time scale that's envisioned is pretty large. Very large, yeah. So um, we have uh, writings that have to do with uh, the immediate contemporaneous um, time around Isaiah's you know, middle of the 700s. But um, writings in Isaiah look forward all the way um, to around 500 yeah. um, BC. So, you know, they look forward into the future 150, 200 years. Yeah. Um, and over that time, Isaiah sees how these themes, autonomy and uh, the brokenness of society, 
He sees how they play out. He sees the opportunities that sit before the people. Um, yes, uh, the intervention of superpowers is frightening, but Isaiah says, hey, maybe God can use this to yeah. get people back on track. Right, right. Maybe it can be a gift to help recalibrate people. Um, and then Isaiah sees that, sadly, it will not change anything. Yeah. So he looks forward and he sees the, you know, the, the, the Babylonian exile, but also the sending back of he sees, Cyrus. And he sees maybe, maybe this is the start. Yeah. So, so Isaiah sees the, the intervention of the foreign powers. He sees the, the, um, the eventual um, domination by the foreign powers is they're going to come in and take over Jerusalem and take everybody who's worth anything to exile. He sees that. Um, maybe that will call them back. Yeah. Maybe that will give them a chance to turn their hearts back towards God. Um, and he sees the return from exile, the people giving the land back. And he says, maybe this fresh start will give them a chance. But as Isaiah sees, it doesn't change anything. The people are still deluded with their own capabilities. And the people are still unwilling, and it seems like on both sides, to do anything to fix this broken experience of society. Uh, the wealthy people are not going to give up any of their power and resources, and the poor people will continue to be resentful and incompetent and, uh, and all of the things that uh, work against them. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is what leads Isaiah to this place that sounds a lot like despair. <laughs> In chapter 63 and 64, it's this intense realization of need. God, you have done stuff for us in the past, but we blew it. Every time you handed us an opportunity, we blew it. Um, and you have this very real sense of sin, culpability. Um, and, it, and it leads him to this question, what is the way forward? Yeah, and, and that, that question just down, stands out. How can we be saved? I mean, given all this... And, you know, this, this sort of vision of Isaiah that you say continues on, it really continues on in, in, into the time of, of Jesus' ministry where you see the Sadducees that are, I mean, I, you know, we, we can laugh at, or we can paint them as, as bad guys, but they're trying to maintain this peace with Rome. They're trying to broker national interest with the powers that be, you find, you know, Pharisees that are trying to, you know, get the people to do right, but they're not having much success. I mean, this this sort of vision that Isaiah sees just does continue on in to the time of Jesus. Absolutely, and, and it is um, marked by this reality that it seems like it should be pretty clear how to fix it, but no one is willing uh, to rise to the occasion. And even if individuals are willing, um, the group as a whole is incapable. Yeah. There's this, this vision uh, that, or this image that Isaiah uses in chapter um, 64 where he talks about um, the people being shriveled up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Um, I mean, I think Isaiah comes to this place it's like that, you know, all the vitality is, is gone, all the spiritual vitality is gone. And, and wherever our sins take us. And once again, it's not God being fussy about what we do. It, it's the reality that what we do impacts life and what we have done has drawn the life out of us as a people. And now we're just sort of, as Paul's image in Romans, uh, it's, it's that we've been given over to what we've wanted and what we've wanted destroys us. We're just being blown around. And so Isaiah says, as far as people go, the situation looks pretty, pretty despair. Yeah. And again, I, I think that this can be a difficult message for people. And, you know, you can kind of shake your heads and say, well, you guys, you're just too pessimistic. And if you look on the sunny side, there's good things happening everywhere. Um, and I think the beautiful thing about Isaiah and also the tragic thing is that he was a person who had power and he was a person who had um, hopes and ambitions for the well-being of everybody. Um, he did have the power to say, hey, here's a program we can try. And he also, again, like you said, had the 
um, observation. He had the um, position from that he could see how things worked out, and he could see that they just don't work. Yeah. yeah. Um, the best laid schemes of mice and men. So where <coughs> where does this problem lie? This let's use the word brokenness. I mean, you know, because again, I think so many people in our culture, I'm, sin is a good word. I mean, we need, you know, need to talk about it and define it. But again, I think average person just thinks, oh, sin, you know, that's just God being fussy. That's breaking church. rules that shouldn't be there in the first place. Precisely. That's well said. That's, I think that's the popular view of sin is breaking rules that shouldn't be there in the first place. So let's forget about that. But what Isaiah is talking about is this fundamental deep brokenness right where does it come from <clears throat> right well um let actually let's do a different question first if that's okay. okay yeah yeah so um isaiah identifies this is a persistent problem this is a persistent hole and um isaiah says there's really only one hope and that's going to come through very clearly throughout 63 and 64. And what is the hope that Isaiah looks for? We read it in our verse 5 too. Yeah. <clears throat> Somehow God is going to have to come and fix yeah. it. And, and in the, the first verse of chapter 64 is powerful. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Yeah, absolutely. So Isaiah says, if anything is going to change God, it's going to be on you. We cannot do it for ourselves. And this is not the first place that we've heard this in Isaiah. Go back to 25 and 26. Yeah. Um, and again, Isaiah is uh, weary to the ways of the world. If it could have been done by people, he would have done it. Um, so Isaiah says, there's a hole, and God, you're the only one that can fix it. And I hope you see now how we're really setting ourselves up for Christmas. Um, because it's this hope, it's this confession of need, um, placed on God. God, you see our need. Will you please meet it? Um, and God says, yes, I will meet it. And uh, zoom forward. We see that God meets that need in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to your question. Um, Isaiah identifies the need. The, the need is our brokenness. Isaiah identifies that God is the only one that can fix it. Uh, but this is interesting. I think at Christmas time and through Jesus, God begins to answer in a conversation. One of the things that's interesting to me is that Isaiah says in 63 and 64, God, you have done good stuff for us in the past. Yeah. Um, and there's also this parentheses, and we blew it. And the problem seems to be something inside of us. It's not that God is unwilling or unable to do good things. It's that when God gives us something good, we trash it. So um, that reminds me of kids at Christmas. You give them a good toy and they <laughs> break it, <laughs> break it or abuse it or hit each other with it or whatever the gift was intended for. They don't get you, it. You spend but all this time making it perfect for them and surely they'll appreciate this and they just come in and smash it. And where's the next one? <laughs> and adults do exactly the same. Right. right. The problem is inside of us. It's not that God doesn't give good gifts. It's that we don't know what to do. We can't handle them responsibly. Um, so it's interesting that Isaiah says, God, you're the only one that can do anything about this. Please act. And in Christ, God says, I have acted. Um, interestingly, there's two kind of uh, people that uh, Isaiah looks for um, throughout his book. Um, as the answer to this. And one person we talk about a lot in Lent in the Easter time, Isaiah says there's going to have to be somebody who's going to pay for all of this sin. And we get the songs of the suffering servant in the 50s, the, the, those chapters. The other person that Isaiah envisions as coming to fix things is... It's this uh, character that's right at the beginning of chapter uh, 63 is the warrior coming from Edom uh, with garments stained in crimson. So yeah. it's the warrior, it's the, this Messiah. Warrior king. And not just in 63, but throughout Isaiah, there's this expectation that God is going to send Messiah, good king. And under Messiah, things are going to work out. So um, we have the need, God. You can fill the need. And we trust that you're going to do it by finding a way to pay for our sin and by sending us a king. So God does that in Jesus. But 
It's interesting that God continues the conversation in Jesus because I don't know about you, but when it comes to addressing the brokenness in our, in our lives, Jesus does a couple different things with it. Um, we know that Jesus buys us forgiveness, but that's not all that Jesus does, is it? No, not at all. How else does Jesus deal with our brokenness? Well, there's got to be an inner transformation, an inner change. And so we begin to, to sense this movement of the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, um, that begins to, to work this, this transformation from the inside out. Yeah. So um, it's amazing to me that how um, big the impact is of this gift that we receive at Christmas time, uh, the, the gift of Christmas past when God sent Jesus the first time. Um, Isaiah cried out, and it's a prayer that all of God's people can um, sympathize with. We can't do it by ourselves. Yeah. God, do something for us. Um, and God does that in Jesus. Um, but then, again, God sort of ups the ante. Isaiah, I see that you have concerns about society and the way that people treat each other. And I'll do this thing, but that's not going to change. Just having a new king is not going to change the way that people treat each other. There's one thing that's going to change the way that people treat each other. And it's a change inside of them. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we often take the, the little baby as, you know, the king of our hearts and wants to bless us as individuals. But I, I think the gift that God is giving, um, the void that Isaiah sensed is so much bigger than just that. Yeah. And, and then um, one of the, the themes, too, that comes out of, of chapter 64 is that you've done surprising things in, in the past. Uh, you've been faithful, we've blown it, but you, you keep doing surprising things. So here's this surprising Messiah, the surprising forgiveness of sins, but that's only the beginning. There's this resurrection, the sharing of the Holy Spirit, this new life. And then, as you've been, we've been talking about over the last many weeks in the fall, this new community, you know, this, this new community called the church, the koinonia that stretches across the world. It's not defined by uh, geography, not defined by ethnicity, but this, this new community that's greater. <clears throat> so God does again beyond what we can imagine all through yeah. this, this. And it's comprised by these group of people um, who by grace, become like-minded and wanting to share common life, common will, common vision, um, common commitment to that with God. And uh, that does begin to change societies. That does begin to change the way that groups of people interact with each other. Reminds me of the, your teaching just a couple of weeks ago on Philemon. We mm -hmm. begin to see this whole reorientation of life. And we begin to see the despair of Isaiah is met in a very real way and talk about a surprising way, powerful way, deep way. Um, and the gift of this tiny little baby. So one of the questions that I, I think also I'm kind of reflecting on as I look at this is here's this uh, above and beyond over the top sort of answer to human need, this, this gift that God wants to give. And I think... Isaiah is still wrestling with the idea that, well, God, you've, you've given good gifts in the past. Why haven't we received them? And I think part of the answer and that we come to is uh, maybe people are not desperate enough. We've not gotten to this place where we really <laughs> recognize our need. And that's where Isaiah is. I mean, on, on one reading, uh, this is just sort of depressing that here's this people that that need help, but the problem is they won't be helped. I mean, they're, they're refusing help. They're turning back on, they're back on help. And we perhaps have known people like that in our own experience where you would like to help them, but any help you give them, it's, it's like the child with the toy, except so much more serious. They just take it and destroy it. Yeah. And Isaiah is <clears throat> wrestling with that. Absolutely. Um, so, one of the things that we talked about in preparation for this is how profound the 12-step program is. Yeah. And the reality that you cannot get help until you 
understand that you have a need or that you have a problem. And uh, a little bit of this does have to do with um, perception. So um, one of the things that I was kind of um, musing about is um, when you really care about something, um, whether it be art or music um, or food or um, athletics, whatever, um, you understand the, the different uh, grades, you understand what makes something a masterpiece or what makes something a, a truly unique performance, and you understand the gulf that is between them. Um, Dad and I are runners, and one of the exciting things that's happening now is um, the progression, what's happening in the marathon. Yeah. And the times are just becoming unimaginably, mind-numbingly uh, fast. Uh, just a few weeks ago at Chicago, um, a young man ran uh, right at two hours for a marathon, which is 26 miles. Now that might sound to some people like, oh, well, okay, those are two numbers. Right. Go out and try to run <laughs> one mile right. and then imagine 26 miles. I was a decent, decent runner in high school. Um, and uh, my fastest mile was four minutes and 36 seconds. And, um, and I'm not ashamed of that. Um, but what this young man did was he ran 26 of my fastest miles ever back to back to back to back to back to back. It's amazing. But, but uh, the reason I bring this up is I'm sure there are those of you, those of you watching going, well, that's anybody can run. Yeah. <laughs> you have to really be involved with it to understand exactly what that guy's done and exactly what the gulf is yeah. between him and me. And that's true in all different areas. Um, Part of what we need to do today is to, to be honest with ourselves about the gulf that exists and instead of saying, well, it's not that big a deal or, well, you know, people are, people are in a bad way, but they could change it themselves if they wanted to. It's just because they're lazy or dumb. Yeah. Uh, that fails to understand, A, how good things can be and uh, B, how bad we are. Exactly. Learning to be honest is important. And I think, you know, this idea of going back to the 12 steps of just, you know, really reaching bottom, it, it seems like when we talk about the gift that God wants to give us uh, in Christ, it's not the gift of Christmas, it's the gift of Christ that can come any time of year. Uh, it's like, well, why don't people receive this gift? I, I think they really don't recognize their need. There are all kinds of uh, self-help programs. There are all kinds of social redemption programs out there. Um, people are absolutely convinced that we, in our own ability, our own wisdom, our own knowledge, um, we can fix problems. I mean, you know, we can, we can fix our brokenness. Yeah. And they really <clears throat> haven't come to this place where, no, we, we, we really can't. Uh, yeah, 12 step in substance abuse, that is called self-medicating. Yeah. And it is lying to ourselves. And uh, it doesn't stop until you hit rock bottom. I loved your analogy, too, as we were talking about this, this um, you know, this sort of um, love for an art or a sport or something like that. When you really get involved, you, you see the distance between yourself and the master. And re uh, what, reality and what it can be. Yeah. And then you, you made the comment that, one of the things, though, that might begin to bridge that gap uh, might be if that master came and started to actually work with you, whether that be in a musical instrument or even um, athletic training, you know, or, or whatever it is, if that master came and walked alongside of you. Yeah, it's, it's the, well, two things I want to say. A, Going back to this idea of liking stuff, Isaiah is such an important voice, I think, because it would be difficult to find someone who cared more about the reality of life together, political life, however you want to say it, than Isaiah. He cared desperately about it. He knew very much about it. He knew about policies. He's not an idealist, and he's not just throwing ideas out there. The man lived this stuff day in and day out. Yeah. Um, and two, you're right. Um, how different to have someone who is a master just give you a great performance and say, well, enjoy. Yeah, yeah. 
In other words, God, you could do it too if you just yeah. practice. In other, or in other words, you know, God just do something for us. Okay, well, here's a performance. How different than to have the master say, well, how about I just come and stay with you? And how about I teach you? And how about I show you what it means to be me and you can begin to share in my life? So very different. It's um, the idea of the artisan. It's the idea of the disciple. It's the idea of apprenticeship. And, and so when Isaiah says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. So what I hear you saying is it's not necessarily, oh, come fix it for me. Don't give us a performance. Yeah. <laughs> come help us. <laughs> come walk with us. Yeah. And I think, again, um, I'm picking on children now because they're a window into adulthood. Yeah, because I, we're not different than them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know uh, I, I cannot do math at all. I'm just challenged. And I can remember, you know, asking for help as a child. And, and what I really wanted somebody to do is just give me the answer. Don't show me how do to do it. Just, just give me the answer so I can get this done. I can get rid of it and go on my way. But uh, I think that's what we want God to do is just give us the answer, fix it, so I can do what I want to do. It's like, no, um, I'll come and I'll walk with you and I'll become one of you. Yeah. So as we think about Christmas past and... Uh, you know, what is the reality of uh, this little baby born in the manger? I hope this begins to give us a, a bigger perspective on what exactly the gift is that God is trying to give us. It's pretty good. It, it, what the gift is and what our place has to be before we can receive it, I think it's just critical as we enter into the season. Um, unless we're desperate, I don't, desperate for God, and desperate for answers. I'm not really sure we're going to receive very much. Well, unless we're honest about the way things really lie. Yeah, it, with ourselves and with our world. And that's, as you said, that, that is the genius of Isaiah. I mean, he he got the world. Oh, yeah. You know, he got the, but he also got the interior. Oh, yeah, he, he, he is far from a, a philosopher, you know, just throwing out ideas. Um, he's, not, <laughs> he's not an idealist. He's a man who, who lived policy and um, all this stuff every day that was his job yeah wow it's good to know that this this good news is it's good news for life it's not you know just well it's good news for people yeah it's not just good news for souls or spirits or individuals it is good news for people yeah amen well nathaniel thank you for just uh sitting down and thinking through this first sunday of advent um, hope that you'll uh, either join us online, but if you can, if you're in the city, uh, please stop by and worship with us here at Trinity Church. Uh, we have, we're having a good time together as we uh, not only worship, but just fellowship. We enjoy each other's company. So come and join us in this beautiful Christmas season. And we have several special events. You've mentioned our, I think our cantata that's coming up, uh, one of our Sundays, uh, the 17th of December. Then a beautiful love feast on the 24th of December. And so lots to look forward to during this beautiful season. Well, thank you. Nathaniel, could you pray for us? Sure. Father, thank you again uh, for the gift that you want to give us. Um, the gift of yourself, God with us. Uh, we pray that you would give us grace to be honest with ourselves about the way that things really lie. And that doesn't mean beating ourselves up or being dark and gloomy and pessimistic. It just means being honest. Uh, Lord, you are honest about where we are, and you are honest about what it takes to get us out of it, and you've extended that offer to us. So please give us grace to take you up on that offer. It's easy to say that we want something different. Sometimes it's hard to actually be something different. So we pray that you would give us that grace too. And we know that this isn't a great prayer because it's something that you've said many times you're very interested in. So uh, please meet us where we are. Help us to receive the gifts that you're trying to give us uh, and make us into a people who um, are a glory to you, an alternative uh, in a broken and dying world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Good night.